First, I'd like to start today's talk by acknowledging that we're on Gadigal country of the Eora Nation um, and really kind of extend a really um, a ha an enormous heartfelt thank you to the Gadigal community who have really made this project possible. Um, you know, working on their country with their knowledge um, and working with their language as well, which is what you can hear behind us. So, as many of you would know, the project is really looking at. Um, the project is really looking at the Garden Palace, um, the destruction of the Garden Palace, um, and it's really recalling that memory through four kind of key moments. Um, and the four key moments really include um, the shields that literally mark out the entire footprint of the building, so 15,000 shields that we've created that mark out the site. Uh, the eight different language groups who, through language, have remembered lost objects, which we can hear behind us here. Um, the, the grassland in the centre, which is actually marks where the dome of the building used to be. And the fourth and probably, I think, one of the most important um, elements of the project are these programs and your participation. This idea that together we can um, remember things... Uh, sorry, I keep talking. Um, and that together we can remember this story and keep this story alive. Um, so in many, many ways, the responsibility is now, um, now I'm like hearing myself and that's weird. No, no, I'll stand over here, that's fine. Um, so, um, so the responsibility is on us now um, because this really was a forgotten part of our history um, and the reason we forgot it was us, we, we let it go. Um, and yet when we look at this story, understand the story, we can actually see that it's something quite important to us and something I think very much worth remembering. Um, from my position, of course, um, my family's Roger and Camilla Roy, so the reason I'm particularly interested in this story is the loss of Aboriginal objects that occurred in the fire. Yet I can guarantee every single one of you are connected to this building and connected to the contents that was lost, connected to the history that it represents. Um, this is a really important building for Sydney um, and for Australia. So. So it's a story which we all are in, in heavily invested in. I should also thank you all for trusting the weather. Um, if anything goes wrong um, and it does start raining, we'll, um, we'll go over to the pavilion. But for now, we'll, we'll, hold, um, we'll hold strong um, and, and hope for the best. Um, today, what I wanted to do is talk about the Garden Palace fire. Um, because it was today, uh, in 1882, um, that the fire occurred. Today is the anniversary of the fire. Um, so um, in 1882, we could not have been standing here. This building um, was completely ablaze um, and we were not able to get anywhere near it. Um, in fact, it was such an inferno that the volunteer firefighting brigade um, were unable to do anything. All they could do was sit back and watch the blaze burn. Um, and so I thought today would be a really appropriate time to talk about the fire, the meaning of fire, and what fire has come to represent in the project. I honestly believe that one of the key reasons we've forgotten this story is because of the fire. The idea that when you destroy something, that's the end of the story. The idea that you burn something, you destroy it, it's over. You know, if you're trying to destroy evidence, you throw it in the fire. Um, and that, I think, is a very Western view, a very Western way of understanding um, uh, knowledge, a very Western way of understanding material. Um, because in Aboriginal communities, um, like many other communities right around the world, fire is um, the start of life. Um, fire is the beginning of something. You burn things to bring back life. Um, and of course, fire has been used in this country for thousands and thousands of generations. Um, people have been using fire to manage this landscape, to create relationships, to look after country and to build kind of a, a resilience within the landscape. So from an Aboriginal perspective, when we look at this story, the fire is not the end. The fire is simply a new beginning, a new chapter. Um, and I honestly believe that one of the reasons people haven't continued researching the Garden Palace, haven't continued looking at this story, is because of this, this Western idea that we have that the fire is the end of something. And you sort of draw a line underneath it and, and it's over. And so um, what we've tried to do is bring an Aboriginal lens to this project um, and bring an Aboriginal story. 
I've also been really interested in the idea that this building, of course, was constructed as a complete imperial vision. It was the sort of imperial glory of Sydney. Um, it represented more to do with the empire and more to do with um, British ideas of, of, of nationhood than it did Australian ideas of nationhood. The whole project of, garden, of the Garden Palace and World Fairs was to create, I guess, a web, a political web where the colonies um, were linked to, to, to the empire. And so for us that, of course, was Britain. And of course, these whole, the whole Garden Palace, this whole concept is, is of course born out of the idea of the Crystal Palace in London and that idea of commerce, trade and relationships. So this is a really important time in the world where colonies are producing goods um, and things are shifting a little bit. You know, it's not... You know, I think it was only in... Oh, God, this is going to test my memory. I, I have a feeling it was in, 18, in the 1840s now, someone might correct me, and if you know, call out. But it was in the 1840s that the, the, the British government stopped funding the military here. So Australia is literally starting to slowly get independent. You know, that idea of slowly pulling back the reins. Um, and yet Australia was still a British subject and we were still all British citizens at that time. And unless you were Aboriginal, you, you weren't a, a citizen at all. Um, but in fact... The notion that this imperial vision stood here for me, um, I think sits against what the landscape is really trying to do here. Um, and I strongly believe that in fact, you know, perhaps we can raise the idea, raise the notion that it was the landscape itself that rejected this building, that the landscape ignited this building and caused it to be destroyed. Because there are no, um, there's no reasons, there's no, um, there's no police. There's there's a one police report of a man running away, um, but nothing. No one was ever charged, and nothing was ever kind of, um, I guess, a, no definitive answer on how the Garden Palace started its fire was 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 created. And so for me, I think about this idea of fire as a way of cleansing the landscape. And for me, the the reason we had to cleanse it was because it was such an imperial vision, it was such a sort of imperial gestation of, of ideas um, and for Aboriginal people what that meant was that of course we were portrayed as, um, as, as violent savages who were dying out um, and the reason we know that that portrayal was cr constructed was of course our, the way our cultural material was framed. So the material that was shown here was really um, men's weapons or what was described as men's weapons um, along with our ancestral remains. And so what does that say about a group of people when all you show are their weapons and their um, ancestral remains, so body parts, skulls, hands, um, full, full skeletal remains on show? What are you trying to say about a people? And when we look at the, the story, of course, Australia is the only country in the Commonwealth that still today doesn't have a treaty with its, with its Aboriginal community. Um, it's around this time, of course, that New Zealand is already drafting up a treaty um, that uh, America is drafting up treaties. So treaties are very much part of the world vernacular. They're not unusual, they're not, they're not different. They're, they're part of what Britain is engaging, you know, and the empire is engaging with. And yet that doesn't happen here in Australia. And so we need to construct a new story about how to justify colonisation. And of course, the key way we do that is through um, this notion of supporting terra nullius, that Aboriginal people were not living very sophisticated lives um, and in fact it was natural, natural selection will eventually mean that Aboriginal people will die out um, and Aboriginal people won't be here and there won't be an Aboriginal problem anymore. And so that of course is a completely negative construction of what was going on. Um, Aboriginal people were engaged in very complex societies, um, engaged in very complex ways of living in this land, sustaining life for over 60,000 years, um, 200 different language groups with autonomous ways of living and operating, um, a very unique political system that is, is very, you know, that is, that is highly structured. Um, and so to have this idea portrayed about us wasn't matching the reality. So in some ways, when we've taken this story back to community, people have said to us, well, Maybe it was a good thing that those materials were destroyed. Maybe that story that they were trying to say about us wasn't right um, and that fire wiped the slate clean. You know, and, and I think that's a very empowering position to take as Aboriginal people, that we need to sort of claim that position. Um, 
And of course, fire is used in that way within the landscape. Fire is used as a tool of regeneration. It's used as a tool, as a way of understanding, of re reawakening that, that, that landscape. How are we going with the rain? It is raining. Should we, what do you reckon? Should we, should we, should we move? How are we all feeling? Did we stay? Say there's a few stays. Okay, let's, if it gets any heavier, you just say and we can move. No, no trouble at all. Um, we really need a fire now, don't we? <laughs> and so this notion that we use fire to create regeneration. And so Aboriginal fire has been used for thousands and thousands of years. So this idea that fire being used in this country. And for me, one of the most important symbols of fire and cultural fire and cultural burning is how Aboriginal people in, in, in this landscape here, in, in, in the Eora community, created nowies or canoes, so um, canoes that were created out of bark. Um, and at night time, women would lie in those canoes a, 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 a clay base and light their fire in that canoe and go out onto the water. Um, and this idea of people floating around the harbour, fishing at night, attracting fish with the, with the, with the fire. So fish would come up because they see the light. Um, and you'd catch your fish and you'd cook your fish on that little fire, on your boat. And there's something really beautiful about that idea of how fire is managed and fire is used. Fire has always been a friend in this country. It's only in the last few hundred years that fire not a, not, has, has become such a, a powerful force of destruction.